One of the things that um, I wanted to talk about was this rapport issue and some of the things that we know about uh, doing this. And I think that establishing rapport, um, with some people it's really easy, isn't it? You, it just, you just hit it off and you feel like you're having a good conversation and there's give and take and there's no boundary problems and you understand what they're saying and they understand you. It works very well. With other people it's very difficult. And of course, that's the trick. I work in mental health, so people that I talk to often have difficulty communicating. That's one of the qualities of people who have mental illness is they don't connect very well with other people. One of the things that we have to work out so much with people who, especially if they have chronic mental illnesses, is to try to get them into social networks because socializing is so important for our health. I mean, we are. We are human beings that are born to socialize. We're born to connect. And babies do that from the very first moments after birth. They're looking in your face. They're looking in your eyes. They're hardwired for that. We are social animals. And it's impossible for me to imagine a person being healthy, either emotionally or physically, who's not connected somehow to other people. And one of the things that mental illness does is it creates problems with connection. It makes it hard to connect. It isolates people. And so one of the things that we work hard at in mental health is learning how to talk to people who are hard to talk to. And so too in your population, there are some people that are very easy for you to connect to and that's not the issue, but other people are more difficult. So establishing rapport and having that kind of connection is a difficult skill to teach and one that people learn mostly through experience. And what does that mean? What does it mean when you have experience and all of a sudden you're an experienced practitioner and people come in and you can get them to talk? I was going to, this is a funny story. I had medical students, I'm telling you it's funny so you'll know to laugh. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Anyway, I had, um, one of the things that I did in, at Mendota is I was the doctor on the management and treatment unit, which was where we had our most violent, uh, most dangerous patients in the state. It was a maximum security unit, very small unit. And so I had medical students there and my um, class that I had was teaching them interviewing skills. And so I said, okay, first, there's four very scared medical students because you have to come in through all these different locked gates and bars and you know everyone's locked in their room and all this stuff and so we go into the uh, day room and I say okay there's four of you what we'll do over the next five weeks is you'll all take a turn interviewing one of the patients here and then we'll talk about the interview afterwards and I said I'll do the first one so I had someone come in and we had an interview and I talked to them and then we talked about it afterwards and so forth. So then I said, who wants to do the first interview then the next week? The course, these medical students are so cocky. <laughs> They're so full of themselves. They're just so on top of the world, masters of the universe. So they always volunteer. They're trying to get ahead of other person. So I choose someone, okay, you can do it. And I bring in the patient and this medical student starts to talk to this guy and he won't talk. He stares at him like, who are you? you know? And the medical student is trying and trying and he finally his face starts to flush and he starts sweating a little bit because he's worried he's not going to get an A <laughs> in interviewing and he's always gotten A's all the time and he just strains and strains and strains and then finally the 20 minutes is over and I talk a little bit with the patient get a little bit of data and then he goes back and then I say well how did that go and everyone says you know it was, you, he was really terrible and it, nothing happened and the guy says and finally the medical student blurted out what they always do he said well if I'd had an easy patient like you did Dr. Mays <laughs> it would have been easier to talk to him. So it was the easy patient that made it easy for me to talk to the person, not my skill as an interviewer. So we had to talk a little bit about that, but they all got better as the time went on. Some people are difficult to talk to, and some of you are better at doing that than others. 
And some of the things that you do, I'd like to talk about. Some of the things that might make it easier to talk to people who have a difficult time talking. But it is a skill that you learn, and it doesn't come naturally for all of us. There are lots of things that they will tell you to do um, that will enhance the experience. They tell you, nod your head. They'll tell you, reflect feelings. So someone says, I'm really sad about you know, my relationship, then you say, oh, you must be sad about your relationship. And you reflect that back. Um, you check in with people and say, do I understand? I hear you saying something like that. By the way, um, don't do that with your spouse. I, I, I uh, am married to a nurse, and she swore uh, at her, on her you know, grandmother's grave that she would never do one thing, and that is she would never marry a doctor. And what happened was, I wasn't a doctor, I was a graduate student in linguistics. Um, and we got connected and involved and married, and I changed and said, I'm gonna go to medical school, I wanna do this. And she, it was a bad moment. Um, <laughs> but in any case, she had, as a nurse, she'd been through counseling and all that kind of stuff, and she knew all of the words. And I can remember one fight that we were having somewhere along the way, and I made the mistake of saying, I hear you saying <laughs> something, and she, just exploded. <laughs> I never did that again. So these techniques, don't try them on your spouse. I don't recommend it, especially if they've heard of them before, because they'll know what's happening, and they'll feel manipulated. Anyway, they'll tell you all of these things to do to show that you're listening. And what I'd like to tell you is, if you're listening, you don't really need to work at showing someone that you're listening. It will be there. But the key to listening is you have to be interested. And that, I think, is part of the trick that I would tell you. Everybody has a story. Everybody has something to say. And are you OK? OK, all right. Is that going to do anything? Everyone has something to say. One of the reasons that we have trouble listening to people is we're so worried about what we're gonna say next. And so if you're always thinking about, oh, how am I gonna respond when this person says X? Or what piece of advice can I give? Or how can I um, be wise in this moment and say something that the wise you know, practitioner would say? How am I gonna get this person to do something? As long as your mind is so preoccupied with that, you're not going to be present, you're not going to be listening. Now, you can do a good imitation of that. I mean, people can pretend to listen, and you can spend your days doing that, sort of thinking about something else. But I would suggest to you that uh, mostly people can pick that up, that the experience of being listened to is a very special one. And most of us don't get it very often. And when we do, we notice it, and we value it very much. So. If you can take the time to be present with somebody, and for me that it involves taking a breath, letting it out, and asking somebody, I don't know how you start your conversations, but I usually start mine with, what brings you here, or how can I help you, or what's going on, whatever it is that you decide to say. And as you say it, you have to cultivate a thought, a feeling, a state, that you have all the time in the world. Take a breath. What brings you in here today? And you have all the time in the world. Now, I know our secret is you don't have all the time in the world. You're probably running late. You've got things that you have to do. But don't look at your watch. Don't worry about what's going on with the clock. And don't be thinking about what you're going to say next. But actually sit and listen. What the client says to you is more important than what you say to them. I said that this morning, and I mean it. I wasn't just sort of throwing out some sort of cliche. It's true, because if people feel listened to, then they trust you, then they're more open to hear what you have to say. And what we want is we want to try to get people to do what we want them to do, which in our case is stop smoking, stop drinking. Pay attention to this. So people need to connect. They need to trust you. They need to feel listened to. So that's one of the big, very most important parts of developing rapport and having people 
connect with you, is getting them to listen. Let me take a look here at my notes and make sure I don't forget anything that um, I wanted to say in my kind of rambling here. Oh, I have, um, you will see on one of your sheets, 21, that there's some common errors that people uh, use in trying to establish a rapport with people. And one of those is undue familiarity. And I, I especially younger practitioners and younger <coughs> therapists will do this. I talked about how we might use self-disclosure to try to s establish rapport. You can also do undue familiarity. Um, you don't do this, but some people do. You know, calling patients honey and you know that kind. I mean, you just hate that, especially you get older. It happens more when you get older. Nobody used to call me honey when I didn't have gray hair, but now they're starting to call me hun or dear, and I don't like it very much. Um, so uh, anyway, that's a, a very gross example of undue familiarity. You, would, you could do that more subtly, but this sort of uh, assuming we're good friends, we're going to talk now, you can tell me everything. I think that there's ways that you can do that that are very disrespectful to somebody. We should let them set up where the boundaries are going to be and how they're going to regard us. I, I'm very careful about calling people by their first names, for instance. That's me, it, I think that works maybe better for my generation um, than if you're younger or as young as the clients you're seeing. But you need to kind of work about that. The idea is that I'm going to be respectful to you. I'm going to let you set our boundaries. I'm going to let you determine a lot of these parameters. And um, the pseudo-mutuality, uh, same thing, uh, self-disclosure, I've talked about inappropriate humor. I probably don't need to say anymore. Some people are just uh, bad about that. They think if they get someone laughing with them um, that they're going to talk with them more. Sometimes that's the case, but sometimes it isn't. I like, uh, I enjoy laughing. I enjoy having a sense of humor, but I'm very careful with that when I'm meeting people because, you know, people aren't necessarily in a mood to be laughing about something. So just watch it. Be a little bit careful with that at trying to shortcut developing rapport. Um, I mentioned that sometimes it's easier to get people uh, in a place where they talk to you better if you talk about something else. I don't know if that's the case with your clients. I can tell you with me, um, especially with younger people, uh, when I'm dealing with uh, young men or young women, if we can talk about something else besides their mental health issue, we can talk about music or sports or something like that, I can find out what they're interested in. And I'm usually interested in most things. I especially find it useful if I can get them to teach me something that I didn't know. Oh, you seem to know a lot about this. I was wondering about this music group. Um, can you tell me about that? And sometimes people will respond to that. So it's a way to establish a human connection with someone before you move into some of the difficult subject matter. Keep your mouth shut. That's so hard for us. Um, Don't jump to conclusions. That's also easy to do. If we assume that other people's experience is our experience, um, we can go down, we can waste a lot of time because um, we're often wrong. So just because someone uses words and you think that you understand them um, because that's how you felt in this circumstance or this is how imagined they feel, you need to be careful about that. Watch out for these assumptions that you make. Uh, aim to be positive and enjoyable if possible. We'd like people to like to come to see you, not dread going to see you and working with you. Um, I don't know how that will be. Different people will have different degrees of enjoyment or um, pleasure in seeing you, but that's something that you'd like to have happen. It shouldn't be an onerous experience. Um, and you don't have to have all the answers. I got to tell you, that was such a relief to me. Because in all of my training and all the examples that I read, you know, the pedagogic examples in the journals and the books, it was always a therapist who were saying the right thing at just the right moment, and a person throws aside all of their neuroses and problems and says, I see it now. You are so, so wise. I am, this is the greatest day of my life. And they just said something like, I bet your father was like this, or something like that. And it just changed them. And I wanted to be that guy. 
Did you ever see ordinary people, Judd Hirsch, dealing with the kid? I mean, these therapists on, in the movies, they're always so great. They always say the right thing. For, let's see, for almost 40 years, I tried to do that, and I never did it. And I finally gave up. And my life got so much better when I stopped trying to worry about saying the right thing. I don't worry about what I'm going to say. Most of the time, in fact, when people present these horrible situations or horrible problems to me and say, what can I do or what should I do, I now say, I don't know. It sounds like a mess. And I found that that's the best answer that I've come up with in 40 years. I get more of a response from people when I say that than when I say, well, you really should divorce that man and uh, give the kids up for adoption because they're a mess. Or, you know, I don't say that. But other stuff like that. When I try to be wise, it never really stuck. But when I say, I don't know what to do, your life's a mess, you must feel really trapped then I get great responses, and people start suggesting what they should do, and they start making changes. So one of the things that I would urge you to do is to, if you do have answers, to try to forget them um, and go back to not knowing what the answer is. It's probably a better, uh, more honest stance for you to have anyway. Um, let's see, Jeff, well, create, balance, talking, listening. Uh, know what a good conversation feels like. Uh, take a deep breath. Infinite patience brings immediate results. I love that. Infinite patience brings immediate results. You have all the time in the world. You can do that. You can do that right now, even though you've got just a few minutes with somebody. I used to tell, uh, when I, this, going back again to medical students trying to t teach interviewing, we come in and we've got this list of like 40 things that you've got to find out when you talk to someone. I have to know how, you know, do you have brothers or sisters? What, what was it like in school? How far did you go in school? Have you ever been arrested? What were your parents like? Um, you know, all of these questions. And so my medical students start out with their sheet and they got this and they're writing down and they're, and they're asking these questions and they're getting one word answers. You know, how many brothers and sisters? I have six set brothers and four of them and they're writing all this stuff down. And um, it's extremely tedious, and they end up not getting much information. They certainly don't get to know the person. And we've spent half an hour, and the forms are filled out, but we don't know anything. And so toward the end of my interviewing class, I'm telling them, why don't you put the sheet aside? I know that you have to get all this information. We need it for the chart. But why don't we put that aside this time and just have a conversation? with the patient who comes in. And what we find is if we talk to people and we listen, which means we follow where they're leading in the conversation. So you pick up what someone's talking about and you pursue that. Clients are very forgiving. You can, you can misunderstand them time after time after time. I do that all the time. I misunderstood you. And I, and I ask a question, and we're off the topic. I think it's the topic, but it's not the topic. But they'll bring you back. If you listen, they'll come back to what they want to talk about. And then I think I'll understand, and I'll say this, and this is what you and tell me more about that. And then they'll eventually bring me back to what they want to talk about. And then finally, I get it. Oh, this is what you meant. And they smile and they say, yes, it's taken us 15 minutes, but they finally I understood what they said in the very first sentence of the interview. If you listen, if you follow the, the white heat of relevance, if you see what they're talking about, you've got, to have it, you've got to have your mind clear to do this. If you hear what they're saying and you pursue that, the form gets filled out. When you're done, with your 30-minute interview, you've had a relevant conversation, you've established good rapport, you've had good personal contact, you understand what's going on, and by the way, along the way, you've picked up almost everything you need to know to fill out that form. Now, sometimes you don't. Sometimes, here's, here's the way I do it. I have this conversation. 
I follow what people are saying. I try to connect. I try to understand. I'm really stupid. I don't get it. But people, if I listen enough, they'll be patient enough. They'll bring me back, and I'll finally get what it is they wanted me to say. And then we're done, and I take the form, and I look at it and say, oh, I didn't ask you. Did you, what kind of grades did you get in phys ed in your sophomore year? I don't know, stupid <laughs> things on the form that you got to have. So I go back and I say, here's a couple things that I need to find out. I, I don't remember. But we've had a good conversation. If you just go to the form, you'll miss all that. And it's, it's just not worth it. Most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. I said that earlier today, and I didn't say it first, but it's absolutely the truth. Um, Philip Stanhope, Earl of Chesterfield, said, but you don't know what he said. He said this, many a man would rather you heard his story than granted his request. The reason I included that is because I think that gets to the point if people don't really want answers to their problems so much as they want someone to listen to them, listen to what they have to say. And that's what I finally understood when I gave up trying to come up with answers for everybody. When I would say, I'm going to listen rather than try to figure out what I should tell you to do. It makes a difference. And actually, that's what people want most of the time anyway. Um, don't repeat yourself over and over. Don't get over detailed. Be brief. Um, if your mouth is open, you're not listening. Keep your mouth shut as often as you possibly can. You pick up a theme there. The one other thing I have here on my notes that I want to be sure to talk about, and then I'm just going to talk with you or if you have any questions or comments is the electronic health record. I don't know if you're using those or not, are you? This is uh, interesting, an interesting issue. I understand the benefit of the electronic health record. The benefit of the electronic health record is that your records are available when people need them, no matter where you are being seen. If you are in uh, an ER in another state, if you're traveling around, other doctors have access to your records. It's a really good thing. The problems with the electronic health record are that there are problems with confidentiality and security. There's problems with um, access. And what I found right away is that there were problems with me talking to my doctor. One of the things that happens when you get older, I didn't know this, I'm warning you, um, is your doctor retires. I mean, I, th I knew I would get older, but I thought I'd just keep seeing the same dentist, the same doctor, and all that. But they're retiring. They're quitting. They're moving to Arizona. And um, my doctor retired. So I, uh, I, I got a new doctor. This was last year. I got a new doctor. I got a 16-year-old from Iowa. <laughs> and. Um, so I came in to see her, and we're getting acquainted. It's my first appointment. She's about to, it, later in the appointment, she's going to argue with me about why I should take medicine for my cholesterol. And I'm saying, but Dr. Israel didn't say I had to take medicine for my cholesterol. And she's saying, but the data says. And I'm saying, well, what does the data say about me and my situation? But that's to come later. Right now, what's coming is I'm telling, she's asking me about myself and going over my record and that kind of thing, and she's staring at her computer. I'm sitting here, and she's sitting at a desk, and the computer's open, right? And she's doing this. Now, what am I doing? I'm doing this. Because I, I want to know what the computer says. And the other thing that we know is patients always look where the doctor looks. So if the doctor's looking over here, I'm going to look over there. And she's paying attention to the computer and typing on it. She's not looking at me. I found that very off-putting. It turns out I'm not the only one. There was some research done at um, Northwestern University along with UW. And they looked at the effect of having the electronic health record with physicians in their face-to-face -face contact with patients. And just to get the numbers right, they looked at 100 different visits in 
um, electronic health record visits, clients spent 31% of their time looking at a computer screen. In the non-electronic health care visits, clinicians spent 9% of their time looking at the chart. So basically, clinicians are spending three times more of your appointment time looking at a computer screen than they used to when they would have a written record. I mention that because my whole point today was having you pay attention to the relationship that you have with your clients. And you will not be deepening that relationship if you're staring at a computer screen typing during that time. So just be aware of that. I think it is another um, way that um, technology is putting itself between us and our clients and between you and your doctor too. So that was just, I thought, some interesting data. Now that's all I had uh, in terms of my planned remarks and um, I would be happy to talk with you about anything you want to talk about. I have all the time in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I don't, but I do have half an hour if you want it. If there's any questions or comments or anything that you'd like to say, that's just fine with me. Yeah, so they get one word answers. Yeah. Are you drinking? No. Um, well, I was wondering why you were referred here. If you aren't, I don't know. And pause, 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 pause. Um, sometimes there's nothing you can do about that. Sometimes people are just not forthcoming. It might be uh, the situation that they feel intimidated, or maybe they're just like this. I dated a girl like that once. I couldn't tell you, she just never said anything. I'd bring out my PowerPoint slides. I'd <laughs> no, I didn't do it. It was before that. Some people are just more laconic. I think of my, my wife's relatives in Kansas. Uh, they just don't talk. Um, so there's that. The, other, the typical things that we would tell people to do is to work on making sure that your questions are open-ended questions. All of us have a tendency to ask people questions uh, that are closed. We don't intend them to be um, that. So say someone comes in and says, um, I had a fight with my boyfriend and that's why I was late. And then your question will be, well, are you, are you upset about that? Or did that upset you? Now that seems like a natural thing and, and a normal in a normal conversation with your friends, they'd say, yes, here's how I felt. But if you look at that, that's actually a yes or no question. So the better question is, how did you feel? Or how are you feeling? That's a, it's a skill. It's not a hard one to learn. But I'm surprised how much I ask closed questions, even though I know I shouldn't. It seems to flow very naturally. So try to ask questions that elicit, that make people say more than one word. That would be one thing. The other thing is to see if there are certain topics that the person is more willing to expound about. And then you'll know, well, it must be this topic. They're, they're nervous about it. Sometimes I will ask people, now this has to do with um, I guess this is related. I'm thinking when I'm doing suicide risk assessment, uh, I will often get sort of short cutoff answers. And I might comment, it looks like this is something that's hard for you to talk about, just to sort of make an observation. Or um, I wonder if you could expand on that. But, but just to acknowledge, is this hard to talk about? Or is, is this just, am I not doing a good job asking questions? So you might ask someone about it, but I think the main thing is to look for areas that the person is more verbal about, if there are any. Make sure that your questions are open-ended questions, not closed questions, uh, which is very, very common. 
And then some people just, they just aren't going to talk to you. And, the, and that's okay. I mean, that's not my fault. Maybe they'll talk to someone else, but they're not going to talk to me. So you do the best you can. What other things come up in your work that if you like to ask me anything about? I, th I think it does. The question is uh, whether if you use a depression screen or something like that, how does that affect the relationship with the client? One of the things that we know from mental health work is that people, patients, really like taking tests and doing scales. They re they, I don't know what this is, but they just like it. And people do better if you are having, if you're sort of following their progress by having them fill out a questionnaire in the waiting room. It doesn't even have to take any of your time. But you have them fill out a questionnaire and you say, let's see how you're doing. And we'll compare that. People th think that they're getting better care when that happens. I think they might be. Now, off, you know, often the, the questionnaires are going to miss things. These are not a substitute for a good interview. It's like we can't have the computer do our work for us. But it may remind us or, or jog our uh, activity or give our clients uh, time to talk about something that's going on with them. So to answer your question, I think for the most part, at least in the mental health research, people respond well to having, doing some sort of scale, some sort of test. The way I equate this when I talk to my medical students is if you're treating depression and you're not using some sort of depression questionnaire, it's like trying to treat blood pressure and you don't use a stethoscope. You're not sort of measuring your progress and seeing how you're doing. So I think that could be a good thing. If, if people are really put off by it, you can just respond to it like that. But I think most of the time people are okay with that. Yeah, so some people talk too much and um, it, it's not helpful. You know, if, if someone's telling you data that's very important, then you'd say, well, this is good. Let's, let's hear what you have to say. Other people, it's just, uh, they're just, they just talk, 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 talk. I don't know if it's anxiety or it's their style or whatever. And you have to move on. You can't sit here and listen to this. How do you do this in a way that you're not um, shutting them down or being offensive or rude or whatever? Um, what, it can be hard. It, sometimes people can take a hint when you interrupt them and ask them another question. Say, well, we need to, I need to find out some other things here. So I understand this is about your boyfriend, but let me ask some other things. I want to know about how your eating's going, you know, what's going on with support, how is your finances, did you get that application into whatever. And so you just interrupt people, and sometimes then you can do that. Um, other times, um, I just will have to say to someone, I, I would, maybe I, I shouldn't say this because it's sort of a lie. I would love to hear all this. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> uh, but I just don't have time. Here's what I need to know. So I just, you just do it, and you titrate it, little hints, bigger hints, and then finally taking control of the interview. I just can't listen to all this. So it's, it's hard. Most people will, can get some sort of hint. Now I deal with people who have, remember our interview that I showed you. I couldn't control his talk, but he was manic or psychotic or both. So in that case with him, I, I just say, um, I'm going to have to stop now because I'm not going to get any more data from him. It's just too painful, and I need to leave. It's been an hour, and I need to leave. So I'll say, I, I'm going to have to stop now. Um, I'll talk with you some other time. And you just have to leave the room. But you, you shouldn't have problems that severe. You should just have problems who are with people who just are either desperate for someone to talk to, or they just don't have good boundaries. They just do not. I think uh, oftentimes we sit with people who just are not good at gauging their audience. They don't know that they're being boring or that they're being repetitive or that you've got something else to do. They, they lack that degree of empathy. 
because they've never been trained or they don't have the, the ability to have it. People with attention deficit disorder often have that as one of their problems, is they can't gauge their audience. They don't know that people are tired of this story. They don't want to hear something else, or uh, people aren't listening, or, or they don't think that this is funny when they think they're being funny. So uh, people with attention problems um, or other sorts of problems may just talk, and you just need to be firm and control the interview. Another thing I will do is start asking yes and no questions, one-word answers, rather than open-ended questions. So. Try that. That's tricky, I would think. Um, it's one thing if you're the professional in the office and the person's come to you, it's clear what everybody's roles are, but when you go into their area and you are sort of at the mercy of the chaos of their home or what's going on, then you're looking more like a friend or more like some sort of hybrid between professional and intruder and something else and you can feel pretty uncomfortable with that. I would feel uncomfortable with that. I did, um, in mental health, I did a lot of home visits when I worked with an assertive community treatment program and I did that and um, I'll tell you the, the thing that saved me most of the time from be feeling very awkward and very um, out of sorts doing it was I did it as a team. I went with somebody else and that provided some grounding. I'm assuming that you're ending up doing this by yourself, is that right? right. That's, that would be hard. I, I, I guess I don't have a, um, a real good answer for that. You, you just have to be clear in your own mind what you will accept and what you don't. I think there's a bit of an analogy when people give gifts to us, patients give gifts. Um, for me, I know when a gift is appropriate and I, I don't want to be rude and refuse it versus this is too much, I can't do this, I don't feel good about it. It's a matter of um, experience and knowing what your role is. I find, um, for me, this helps too with uh, my age and my generation. I tend to be f a little bit more formal than some of the younger doctors that I work with. Just um, calling people Mr., Miss, Mrs., whatever, no first names. Um, and that helps me. I can be warm. I can be warm, but I can still be separate, professional. I have my professional hat on when I come in here. I think um, sometimes people say, well, I, I, I want to care about these people. I want to be close to them. And, and, I, and I guess um, I'm repeating myself. I said, don't do that, but I will with you. <laughs> there, I think you can be warm and compassionate and still be separate. Very interesting research about psychiatry units which units are the most helpful to mental health patients, people in the hospital? And they looked at three different kinds of units. They looked at units that were hostile and distant and uh, punitive. They looked at units that were very touchy-feely, warm, you know, nurses hugging everybody, patients hugging each other, doctors hugging every, you know, that kind of really warm, we're all in this together. And they looked at units that were uh, professional. They were distant. They weren't harsh. They weren't punitive. But they, you know, I'm staff, you're patient. These are the rules. We do this. Um, I will take care of you, but I don't love you because this is my job. But I'll do a good job. And what they found, since I'm telling you the story, you can guess, those units were the ones that patients got better faster. Being too enmeshed or being too harsh is not good for people. So what our clients need from us is to not be their friends, they need us to be their caregiver. 
and how you do that, you will find your own style. But for me, um, I found it, and it's uh, a little bit to the formal side, but it's also warm, and I listen. And people know that I care about what's going on, but they also know uh, don't ask to be friends on Facebook. You know, that I don't do that. So that's, and you'll just have to find a place. That your challenge is one that I haven't faced, but that would be tricky. That could be tricky. My wife had um, hip replacement this uh, last fall, and we had a physical therapist visit come into our home. And this is the first time we've ever had a healthcare professional. I suppose it's a sign of what's coming, but um, it's the first time that we had uh, someone come in. Um, and he just had a very nice style, but we also had good boundaries with him. We're friendly, but he's the physical therapist, and you know, we don't fix lunch for him when he's there and, and all that. So it's tricky. I, I had a feeling, I bet, that, I bet he has some interesting challenges in his work. What other things happened to you or what else would you like me to not answer? Anything? Well, you know, I think you've had a long day. <laughs> you didn't get to go out and walk around for a while. I really enjoyed uh, being here today. I enjoy it. I really value the work you do. I think you're saving the future of the whole world, uh, which you can't do much better than that. So you should be proud of what you do. And I am honored to be able to be here and talk to you about anything that may be helpful to you. So good luck. You got my email address. Email me if you've got other questions or anything you want to know. So. <laughs>